I feel better. Oh, really? Okay. You feel more sore. Any, any particular area in there? Yeah. Okay. So I um I call I called you around here because um first of all it's sort of not very cluttered, so that's great. Uh but to just go through through some really um uh points about that lesson that we started yesterday with Jenny. Because there was a lot of little points all the way along, um, and it's quite rich and dense. So I thought, okay, maybe if we go through that, that would, um, that would help. Okay. So um, first of all, uh, is who really enjoyed doing that lesson yesterday? You really enjoyed it? Oh, wow. We've got a selection here. Do <laughs> you want to come up the front here? Yeah. Please take a seat. So, um, yeah, just sit down. So the, f the first instruction in the lesson is, um, is sit down and sit down in such a way that you could take hold of your big toe, that you can t catch your foot. So how would you sit to do that? Yep. All right. Now put that down. Yep, put it down. That's it. Now, here's, here's, the, first, here's the first idea. You know that when we're uh, um, verbally guiding you, that it's not instruction. That there's a difference between instruction and offering up an intention. I think I talked about that last segment, yes? So it's, it's an intention. I'm kind of going, here's the intention, and then you do your intention. Now, the thing about intentions is there's a multiplicity of ways of enacting them. There's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. Remember we did that with the little one equals business last segment? For those of you who weren't here last segment, you know, you can have one on this side of the equals equation, and on the other side, one equals one, or one equals two minus one, or one equals... So there's many expressions. So this is, this is how you interpret sitting on the floor to catch your toe. Is there another way? Good, so now you have two. Is there another way? Sorry, you're on the spot. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, that's, that'll be another way, right? Then you, then you need criteria. Which way is better? So if there's a multiplicity of different ways of enacting your intention, which one is better? And this is where things start to get a bit more specific. The way that, first of all, you find it easiest to do. So if I say to you, what's the easiest way to take your toe? How would you sit? How would you sit? So that's the question. How would you sit to make it really easy to get to your toe? Okay. So you re return to your first option. Okay. Yeah? Is that easier? Go back to where you were. Did you see how I directed her attention? Did you see? Sorry. <laughs> I didn't even realize. And then I went, oh, this is, a, this is an educational opportunity. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, sit like that. Yeah, is that easier to get to? Much easier. Now, that's right. That's exactly, that's exactly right. So according to your comfort and according to your structure, you will choose, you, you'll quickly know if that's not easier. However, if it's something that hasn't been considered, in other words, it's not part of your repertoire of what, what could happen, and you go in that position and you go, it's easier. Um, yes, you can.
Yes, and there's a reason for that. I'll get to that in a second. But yes, you, 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 because it's, it's not an instruction, you can ignore the instruction and do what feels okay for you. Notice I use the instruction in two different contexts there. Yeah. So, yeah. Matter of fact, you are always number one priority in a lesson, not the verbal guidance. Please remember that. You are always number one priority. True. Oh, yes, yes. This is... So, so let me go on. Um, so to answer your question directly, the hooking the big toe offers a lot of mobility in terms of where the foot can go compared to if you're holding the whole foot. Because then you've only got one little swivel point. Whereas if you're holding the whole foot, uh, actually your choice was really good, actually holding the toes, that still um, affords some mobility. But if you actually hold the outside edge or the inside edge, you've already got a bias. Can I, can I show? So you see, if I take your foot like this and I pretend I'm holding your foot, so would you say that that's kind of a, a neutral leg? Yes, yeah, kind of like it would be if you were standing. So look what happens if I do this. Look what happens if I do that. So if you hold your now, if you hold your foot from the outside like that, yeah. So look, when she holds her foot like that, the tendency will be for that edge to come this way and her leg will go inwards. Hold it the other way. Um, he can do his job. It's fine. Now, you see, now she wants to push her foot that way, but look, that's where the leg would go now. So, there's, so that's part of the design of the lesson. Hooking the toe, now hook your toe, well, it's very different. Yeah, it can go anywhere. Now, okay, thank you. <laughs> as, as I said, it's densely packed. If you're one of those people that finds it uncomfortable with one figure, Two fingers. Uncomfortable with two fingers? Three fingers. Uncomfortable with three fingers? Hold the toes. So th think of your options. Can't get to your big toe? Take off your sock. Wrap your sock around your big toe. Hold the sock. And because um, and, uh, I'm sharing with you now what I do when I do this lesson because I can't get to my big toe. But hold the sock as if you were hooking your big toe. So it's not hold the sock any old way. Hold the sock in a way as if you are hooking the big toe. Oh, then you can carry on with the lesson. It's easier, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not, she says. Um, no, I'm just fi I just find that holding the big toe by itself gives the foot too much leeway and it's too much strain sort of bracing the ankle and also... Um, fine, hold your toes. My wrists are um, looking after yeah, my wrists that's as fine. well. Hold, hold your toes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so there you are with your big toe hooked in this brand new position, yeah? So first of all, know that every intent has multiple realizations. And one of your guiding things is look for the one that is easiest to do. So you might need to do some comparisons. The hardest one for, to do would be all oh, no, no, the way out here. <laughs> yeah. That's hard. Well, not for you, it's hard, but that's, that's hard. Okay, so now, what was the next instruction? Do you remember? No, no, it was the one before that. No? Sorry, lean on your hand behind you. There we go, that was the next instruction, right? So why lean on your hand? You lean on your hand 
sorry, a quick rhetorical question, right? You lean on your hand to stop all the muscles in your trunk having to do all the work of support. Because if the muscles of the trunk are, are highly occupied with supporting you, they're not necessarily going to be beautifully available for supple motion. If they could be, depending on your skill level, but they're busy. They're busy <laughs> keeping you upright. Or as soon as you lean on your hand, there's some latitude. Now you can go, <sighs> take your hand off, please. Yeah, put your back hand back on. That's it. Take. Now, did you see what happens with her knees? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yes, as soon as you. Oh, look. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the black kind of the back just goes. Ah. Oh. Yeah. And look, the knees. The knees go down. Take your hand off. The knees come up. Remember all those leg muscles that we were looking at. Now her leg muscles are involved in, let's keep her upright. Now, if your leg muscles are involved in keeping yourself upright, in other words, you're using them as tethers, what's your chances of lifting your leg? It's going to be a bit tougher. Yeah, so lean on your hand behind you. There we go. Okay, and now um, lift your foot. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Just That's it. Yeah, nice. No, no, no. Once again, where you take your foot is you can make it as difficult for you as yourself as you want, or you can make it as simple as you want. So lift your foot, put it down. Oh, no hands, mum. <laughs> okay. Now, this is a really interesting moment because uh, please lift and lower your foot. Yeah, just put it down, lift it up, put it down. There we go. Now, that's interesting. When you take your foot over there, you move on your pelvis, yes? Yeah, yeah. There we go. So then as you lift your foot, let the pelvis move on the floor. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, please, rest a moment. So here's another principle. That as soon as you move a part of the body in the gravitational field, you have to rebalance yourself. And um, you can really find that out if at some time during the day you stand right up high on tippy tippy toes and you lift both arms out in front of you. You'll feel, you know, so if you're really in a precarious place and you lift your arms forward, you'll feel how you shift your weight. If you don't, what you'll feel is <laughs> you'll actually just try to stiffen up. Yeah. So where do you shift your weight to when, you, when this big, sorry, it's not that big. <laughs> when, when, when this leg comes forward, where do you, yeah, you go backwards. <laughs> yeah. So how far backwards are you willing to let yourself go? There we go. Yeah, does that make it easier? Yeah. So just like a seesaw, yeah, something goes up, something can go back, but we're much more complicated than a seesaw because there's multiple axes. Every joint is an axis. So find out where, which direction of leaning backwards makes it most easy to lift the leg. Oh, yes. <laughs> Monet would be proud. <laughs> no, really. Yeah. Because when you, this is what's interesting. When you find just the right place, we tend to create very continuous, elegant shapes, not angular shapes. Oh, look at that. Hello. That's a, that's a variation we didn't do yesterday, but that's good. <laughs> yeah. So, from the very get-go, the position you select to whether or not you put your hand behind and then where you put your hand. Is it in a place that can serve you 
or is it just a, a strut to keep yourself upright? So there's lots and lots of choices along the way. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah. How are you going? You all right? <laughs> okay. uh, just to ask Zorin whether as part of the instruction about putting your hand behind you, I understand and we could see about how it helped to, to stabilise. Is it also starting to give you the idea that you could go backwards with your pelvis, for example, which is what starts to give yeah. you the idea that if you roll back, you might be able to release your leg a little bit? Mm -hmm. So, um, pretend that you've never done this lesson for a moment, and there you are holding your toe like that, and um, have your hand off, and I say to you, put your hand behind you, lean it on the floor behind you. Now, that's a very, uh, where? If this was an instructional class, uh, you would get from the student, where do you want me to put my hand? But given that it's not an instructional class, put your, and if you really, the person wasn't getting it, you say, put your hand in a place that gives you some room to move, number one. Put your hand in a place where you feel you can use it. And still the person might put their hand right there. So put your hand really close to you, really close. That's it. There we go. And now lift your foot. <laughs> now, people will do exactly that. Yeah? Now put your hand really, really far away. Really far. Now, you see, now it's hard to get to your foot. So where's the middle ground? Now, because it's not instructional, if you stay within the boundaries of the lesson, then what happens is you need to take a little detour. And you go, put the hand far away from you, put the hand close to you, put it more to the left, put it more to the right, put it here, put it here, and you keep on saying, is that easier? Does that make it simpler? Does the leg get lighter? La, la, la. But, you know, if most people in your class just go, Bloop. no need to take that detour. Yeah. Okay. So now, there you are. Uh, lift your leg and lower it several times. Yeah. That's nice. All right. So they're the first parts of the lesson. You can see how already so many things are playing a part. And then you get to that part of the lesson where you're lying on your back. Remember that part? Your head, hands like this, and you're holding your foot. Could you fly there? Yeah, you can, oh, you can let go. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So put this foot on the knee here. Um, take hold of your big toe with your hand, or your hook, your finger. Put your left hand behind your head. Lift and lower your leg. Lift and lower your leg. And as you lift your leg, lift your head. There we go. And put it down. That's it. Just do that several times. So notice, notice that she's making more and more of a curve. And the muscles that she's using to do that are the flexor muscles. So... Stop a moment, rest, that's enough. Um, so if you're using the muscles on one side of your body to actively move you, the muscles on the other side are being actively inhibited. We have a neural mechanism that does that. Uh, the law of reciprocal inhibition. When the muscle on one side contracts, the muscle on the other side receives a signal to reduce tension. Oh, otherwise, you'd just be working muscle against muscle. Now, this is of a great advantage here because when you, when you make that movement, all the muscles that are involved in extension, involve, including the butt muscle, 
start the switch off. Please, do that movement again. Put your hand behind your head, take hold of your big toe. So every time you lift your leg and your head, you are literally inhibiting the muscles along the rear side of yourself, from here all the way to the buttocks here. And what do the buttocks do? The buttocks pull the thigh this way. As soon as you inhibit the buttocks, the leg can go that way. Thank you. That's enough again. <laughs> You're working too much. So if you weren't flexible in your flexors or you couldn't flex much there, then you could, could you be using your back muscles as part of that movement or no? Or it, you, yeah. could be, um, you could be what Feldenkrais would call parasitically using your back muscles. In other words, it, the back muscles are firing, but they're actually working against you. They're not necessary. Apart from, you know, keeping you um, integral a little bit together, but they're not necessary because they're actually opposing that movement. Like Jenny yesterday, you can't do the one thing and the other thing. You can't say yes and no at the same time. It's not possible. What they call that, that's called um, co-contraction. Everything, everything just goes, <laughs> okay. Great if you're, um, great if you're um, aerial artist and you're having to support someone on your shoulders, but not good for this movement. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, now, please uh, get into that position again. And we'll just re revisit one particular um, idea. Start to roll to your right. Here we go. Yeah. And come back. And you now feel, at what moment does it make sense to lengthen your leg? When would it make sense to lengthen? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. L lengthen your leg halfway. See what happens. Uh, <laughs> yeah? Uh, don't forget to roll. Uh, yeah. Not half. That's enough. You don't, okay, stop. That's enough. <laughs> yeah. So remember the, remember the idea of body weight. That if you lengthen your leg too soon, that means the lever is getting longer. It's getting further away from your center. The tendency at that stage is to accelerate. And you literally will fall. Your nervous system knows that. So it goes, no! <laughs> Don't do that! Yeah? Even if you know it's safe. Now, some of you actually like falling, so you won't stiffen up. This is where individual differences, you know, if, if you're teaching this class to a bunch of acrobats, it's like, what's the problem? But for GP, general public, whoever they are, yeah? That there's a timing involved here. Straight too soon, and you'll feel, oh, I'm going to fall. You'll you'll pull back, but you know, keeping a little ball long enough until you land on your side, and keep that contraction. You've inhibited the back muscles. The leg will just go. <clears throat> so they're the kind of neurological tricks that lie in the background. Do you, do you, do you want, they're the kind of neurological tricks that lie in the background of these lessons. And his experience that informed them was judo. And then he read the explanations for why. Or well, actually, he figured out why. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can I ask you something before she finished? Nina, sorry. Can I use you again for <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't do the lesson yesterday. I have to leave early every day. So yeah. when she was coming back, yes. um, what I observed from that um, from my position is um, like it's really hard to come back. It's not as easy when she's going into the right side. When she's coming back, I don't know, that's my, my feeling from here. You just you know, coming back easily. You just put in a, I can see some effort to try to come back to the center. 
Um, so is there any other way that you can use your legs to come back? <laughs> So, um, given that you didn't do the lesson, um, bend your legs, lie down on your back, have this foot on this knee here. That's it. Take hold of your big toe. Actually, let go of your big toe. So, when it comes to timing, it's even timing. Do you take hold of the big toe first or do you put your hand behind your head first? If you know that you can't reach your big toe or it's not going to be easy, it would make sense. Put your hand, this hand behind your head. Uh, lift your head. Now take hold of your big toe. Easier? Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> okay. Now lift your uh, leg up. That's it, and come back, just that. Yeah, and then as you lift your leg up, flex a little bit more, there we go. And again, that's it. And find out how, uh, how much can you lengthen your leg? How much can you unbend it? There we go. Notice how you start to roll to the right side anyway when you do that, can you feel that? Yeah, go ahead. Now come back. Just hold the big toe nicely. Now, think of just taking your head this way. This way. This way. This way. This way. And bend your leg. Yeah. And come back. Well, yeah, look with your head. Just look with your head. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is where the combination of the two, yes? This is where the combination of the two, a little bit with the leg, a little bit with the head, a little bit with the leg, a little bit with the head, a little bit with the leg, a little bit with the head, a little bit with the leg, a little bit, here we go. And then look, a little bit with the leg, a little bit with the head. Yeah, use your arm, use your arm, use your arm, there we go. Yeah? So it's a little bit ever. Sorry, this is as good as it gets. It's a little bit everywhere. It's a little bit everywhere. And that reminds me, that's one of the things I didn't say at the beginning. It's a little bit everywhere. No, use this arm. Use it. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's enough. Thank you. The <laughs> Uh, can I finish this first? Yeah. I was just so, gonna, going to add, I th I'm pretty sure in January we talked about the ideas of timing, manipulation, yes. and orientation. And it seems that this is a really good example that it's not just about the movement. That we're always interested in, can the movement become easier? Yep or more elegant if it's already easy, or possible if it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And so the questions that we bring to each new movement, it's not just, yeah, how many times can I do this? Has anybody else stopped yet? Can I stop now? <laughs> it, <laughs> it's what would happen if I changed the direction a tiny bit? What would happen if I changed the timing between this part and that part? Is there another part of me that could join in or a part of me that could stop joining in? Is there another way I can do the movement? Yeah. So there's always those kind of three aspects of exploration that are going to inform each different move that we do. Yeah. It's <laughs> like... When you're doing an ATM, and I was gonna, I was having my head to ask you this question. When you're teaching ATMs, you're teaching us ATMs, but you know, just to the GP, the general public, do you, would it, do you think it would be really, would you do this or would it be, it'd be really effective to continually reminding those principles? Hmm. Because I found like I've, 
uh, I've been doing Feldenkrais for a little while and I just still, you know, like those principles are still there, like the hardest habits to break and probably the most like effective ground principles to like have in mind when you're doing any ATM. So like I found myself yesterday, and I don't know if I'm the only one, but like I was really quite sore. Like I was like, I was like, oh, after that, like right one, because I was doing exactly that, I was just like doing it like probably too much just because that's just like, my like ambitious little like thing. I just like throwing myself, you know, around and whatever, but um, you know, it would be really, I don't know, like, is it, you know, I just like need that instruction. I don't yes, know if you it's do. just me, but like, I need to be continually reminded. You just need a reminder. One of the things you'll discover when you start practicing teaching is that a lot of your attention will be taken up with the instructions first. Mm. What am I supposed to say next? What's the next move? Are they doing it? Shit, no, they're not. <laughs> How do I say it again to make sure that these ones do what those ones are doing and those ones don't change because they're already right. So <laughs> then we start to think about what else can we add in to, to kind of um, illuminate and facilitate your experience and you'll hear us often say slowly <laughs> and you'll get sick of that and we get sick of that um, every now and again as a teacher there's enough brain space to remember to bring in some of those other principles which we'll try and do but often there's another kind of theme or thread that we're also trying to remember to uh, to carry through with the lesson. So, so for example, uh, Jenny, yesterday, um, I think I realized that I hadn't mentioned breathing for a whole day. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, but then I, I caught, I was like, oh, I didn't mention breathing for a long, long time, yeah? So all of those things happen. Now, uh, for, remember that one of, uh, one of the articles that you got, for one of your uh, Zoom tutorials was that article by Ellen Langer on, on mindfulness and, and her, uh, as, a, as a psychologist over at Harvard University, um, what she's trying to get to is not the kind of mindfulness that John Kabat-Zinn and uh, meditation does, but it's like, can we get over our mindlessness? Yeah. That's her big thing. Can we just stop being mindless? Which in short terms means, can every now and then we interrupt automatic pilot? That little program that runs in us, we go, yep, I know what this is, and off you go. And, the, and that, this is all about, this is why this whole business of attention, this, this particular segment. How do you switch on your attention? Well, you can switch on your attention, but then what do you switch it on to? And those three things that Jenny mentioned, Yep. <laughs> orientation. What direction, where are you in space? What directions are you moving in space? And which part is moving where? Timing. What is the relative timing of the movements of various body parts? And also generally, fast, slow. And then the last one, which is kind of the most trickiest concept of all, how are you manipulating the body? What are the body relationships? And you can kind of see that it already takes in spatial and temporal, but also in terms of force. You know, how much force are you generating? So those are the three things. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that all, all over thing. So if you're on the floor, if you're on the floor and someone's asked you to hook your big toe, and you have, and then they ask you to lift your foot. Well, how are you going to compose that lifting in terms of muscular recruitment? You could just go, actually, I'll put that foot behind. That's better. Yeah, for me, that's better. That right hip joint's a nuisance. Yeah, so for me, yeah, I'll just tip my pelvis backwards. Don't use my arm at all. That's good. So that's you doing a movement, yeah. not your hand lifting your foot. No, but that's okay. My and hand that's is where part language of me. Trips my hand is lifting my foot. 
<laughs> but notice, you could do the other option. You could go, right? Or you could go, or you could go, or you Hold could go. Hold your breath while you do that. <laughs> so far, it's been trunk, hand, gravity. At no time has this leg been active. It's been this heavy weight in my bloody hands. Whereas, look, I could leave my hand in contact and just lift the leg. But what would happen if you distributed the work a little bit everywhere? So that it's a little bit with the arm, a little bit with the trunk, a little bit with the body, and it becomes kind of okay to do. Yeah? So is that the goal, just to find out? What's, what, what's the most comfortable? The goal is to live the most comfortable life that you can generate. So in doing these exercises, <laughs> it's a bit of a challenge to go, how do you do it? How do you do it? Do you you do asked it? me, is that the goal? I told you what the goal was. Generally, a principal goal is to That have, is the goal. Is to have pleasurable movement. I didn't say pleasurable. I said to be able to lead the best life that you can generate. All right, let's go back a step then to that particular activity, that particular one with hooking the toe, a goal there. What's the goal? To there? lead the best life that you can generate. <laughs> it's a little bit broad. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Are you? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not being a shit. I'm really not being a shit. I'm, I'm giving you the, the undercurrent informing all of Moshe Feldenkrais's work. To be able to generate... Well, no, that's even wrong. That's wrong. Under, the undercurrent of all his work is as human beings, we have the capacity to create the kind of life that we want to lead, the one that feels the best for us. And this is just kind of like a metaphor mm. for that. You extrapolate, surely. You extrapolate that movement to something else, that to which gives you pleasure in movement or the best life you can possibly have. Yeah, this is just a metaphor. And we get hooked up on the metaphor and we forget the general purpose. And until someone asks a proddy question and then you go, oh, yeah, that's what the general purpose is. That's it. <laughs> yeah. So that's what he was interested in. But, of course, there are movement principles that are involved because, you know, part of living a, a, a well healthy, full life is to be able to move yourself in whatever scenario you find yourself in. So if you're in a wheelchair, how can you best move around? How can you best act in a wheelchair? You know, if you can walk on two legs, how best can you walk? If you don't have any arms or legs, how best can you live your life? So in each scenario, the, you have to move. Just like yesterday when we were talking about perception, we have to move ourselves to perceive. So can you see how important animation is in life for every living animal? Animation is really important. It's not insignificant, but what the main purpose is, is how do you live a life that's not just baseline survival? Yeah, and the clearer I can hold that in my mind, the clearer I won't get hooked up into the motion. Soren, just on the yeah, perception. Tell the, hmm? the clock. Yes, go ahead. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. yes. But <laughs> still uh, back on this one. Well, I actually found quite a lot I could do in that, that ATM. But, you know, the, on the perception of, you know, one of the beginning instructions, lift your, lift your leg with your hand, your arm. I, I spent a lot of time actually trying, using my arm to do the lifting. Yeah. And because I thought that was a, an instruction, not a suggested intention, um, or, or, and, and not, not a metaphor for rocking back with your body. Um, 
but you know, and I mean, I did, I, I thought that initially, and I spent quite a bit of time on that. And I, you know, I could have been, if there'd been some suggestion that there was some leeway in that, um, I mean, I may not have been the only one who would oh, have spent definitely. less time trying to find an easier way mm -hmm. to do it. That's why this morning, just to remind you, because you have heard, all of us, you know, 30 years down the track, I still do, I forget these things. I get hooked up in the movement. I forget it. So then it's good for me to remind myself. It's good to have colleagues to remind me. It's good to have a book to remind me, a lesson to remind me. So don't feel alone. It's, it happens. So, of course. Linda. Language does make a difference because if it had the instruction had it been lift your foot, mm -hmm. it's Which different it from lift, <laughs> lift your foot with your arm. No, the instruction was lift your foot. It's a very open ended okay. instruction. Well, that's right. So that's, that does give you the leeway. Only if you remember you have the leeway. <laughs> Life's like this. Yeah. Um, in general, if there's a constraint that's important, we'll point out that it's an important constraint. And if we haven't done that, then the general principle is do it in a way that feels easiest for you. Now, you know, our job standing out the front is to watch if someone's gone completely off tangent and doing something that is either dangerous or not really part of the lesson. Um, and so we might clarify for you. Um, but language is tricky. And often we hear something that we assume means this and only this and not a whole lot of other things. And whether that's when you're on the floor lifting your foot, with or without your arm or your leg or other bits, or whether it's at work or in, at home, um, you know, wherever else you happen to be acting, what we're learning, as Doran said, is how to have a rich and fulfilling life if we're only going to get stuck, well, they said I had to do this, so I did. <laughs> um, and now it's their fault that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... So it is, it is um, important to, to kind of keep that, that possibility of, okay, I'm going to try it as I heard it. And then the next time I do that movement, can I make it easier? And if so, what would I do? Hmm. Would, I, would I use more of me, which is often another general principle? So... so uh, just to follow up on Jenny's, and this is a really short one on my part, can you see the importance of attention and awareness to first of all notice what space am I operating in? I'm operating in a learning space that is actually very, potentially very <coughs> creative. Yeah? You're offered, offered a few little things and then you find connections, you discover connections. So that is where you first have to be mindful. Oh, I'm in an awareness through movement class. What's the culture of awareness through movement class? Ah, oh, that's the culture I'm in. Yeah. Now there was a hand, a couple of hands that shot um, up. Sorry. Um, I was thinking if, um, because we are all, adults and we're looking for instructions. I have my moments. <laughs> <laughs> adults. Um, no, no babies anymore. <laughs> I'm thinking um, if, we, if we put 30 babies yes. in the same place and in this around six months old, yes. they, they try in that what we did yesterday, or what you did, I didn't. Um, and they're not looking for uh, trying something they're going to hurt themselves, or they're not imitating. they just uh, having fun. That's my observation with babies. And grunting and groaning. <laughs> they, they're really, and they're going fast. They're just going down faster, and they're coming back. Yeah. 
and they explore and explore. But what I'm saying is they not um, really looking for the best from the, I mean, if I'm, I'm, I can say to my baby, uh, do this. What? <laughs> like he's in his own process and discovering if I'm not interrupt that process, if I observe him with respect, they just do it. Yeah. And I think in Moshe observing a lot of babies, that's my feeling when we're doing this. And, and he really understood that. that. That's why he approaching things, not instructions. Just you find it for yourself in that space. Um, so when I'm connect with that baby feelings, I get more yeah. the feeling. So, you, so yeah, that's really nice. You know, if you can connect with something that makes sense to you, that you go, oh, yeah, that's the environment I'm in. That's the culture I'm in. I'm in, a, I'm in a baby playground. If that works for you, use it. That will help you to remind yourself, ah, that's what I'm doing. Yeah? Just a few more. Yep, here it comes. <laughs> Chuck! <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, just with instructions, um, I notice, like, say, in dental chairs or at doctors or something like that, people will be instructed to do something, say, open your mouth or, mm -hmm. um, you know, a certain instruction. And invariably, the person who's been given that instruction won't stop until the person tells them to stop, mm -hmm. even though they don't need to have their mouth open or do something like that. So I think we get, you know, we, like what you were saying, we keep thinking we need to be instructed all the time yeah. when we actually have our own ability to function yeah. independently and do we anything do. we like. Yeah. But we forget that. And I think a lot of our society is just basically do this and you'll keep doing it until someone says, don't do that again. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So um, if, if I can make a, a meta observation of your, um, your description there, your hand kind of said it all because you just, your hand just went around and around in a loop. It just went around and around. And then when the instruction came, it was like, do that around and around and around and around. do that around and around. And around. So yeah, we get stuck in loops. That's called going on automatic pilot. Oh. An interesting sort of introduction to education from the mm -hmm. Golden Christ point of view, and it's it's quite it's quite informative. Yes. I, found. I read that on the way down, and it just kind of clicked. This is the preface of the awareness removal book. Yes. Yep. It just had, I think, was very relevant to what we're talking about today. So um, I think let's go over here to Helen and then we'll go to Lockie and we'll finish up with Lockie. Um, <laughs> I could have been asking you for an easier position to start, just was there an alternative way to do something or to a position to be in, starting position to be in several times a day, but um, I didn't. And sometimes I found a position, but I wasn't happy because, in many cases, because my concern was that um, I didn't think that I would be able to experience the movement as it, the AT, that particular ATM was designed yeah. to experience moving that joint or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, throw it over to Lockie, we'll end up with Lockie, but I'll respond, I'll respond to you. And that is, um, because you're in a training program and you're training to be teachers, I can understand that you're also trying to second guess, some of you are trying to second guess, you know, how is this designed, what's the intention of the design? So here's my recommendation to you, and I'm not telling you stop doing that. I'm not telling you that. Do the lesson once just for yourself. 
just for yourself. Next time you do the lesson on tape, go, how is this designed? So think, it's like, um, you know, last segment, everything was food metaphors. Remember that? Yeah. So you go to a restaurant, you, you know, it's a very expensive restaurant. This meal is costing you $150. There's not much of it. So, you know, <laughs> I hate that. Anyway, you got, you put it, it's all about savoring the food. One mouthful, that's basically it. Uh, that's it. Yeah. It's, next time you go to the restaurant, you go, can you ask the chef, how does he do that? How does he make this? But the first time, if you get confused between those two questions, you'll be halfway between each, not fully savouring the food, not fully remembering the recipe. It's halfway house. So why not just occupy yourself with the taste of the food, and then if you're really interested in how that's put together, you come back, you fork out a little bit more money, and you go, hey, how, did, how does he do that? That is absolutely amazing. You know? And most chefs will go, oh, great. If they're not too busy, yeah. Does it make sense? Oh, just one of the comments before reminded me of um, a quote from Keith Johnson, who was one of the grandfathers of improvisation theatre and uh -huh. an educator in his younger days, and um, got given all the kids who couldn't be taught. And I think the the quote, and I'll paraphrase it, was something <laughs> along the lines of, um, "Rather than thinking of children as immature adults, it might be a more healthy and accurate." <laughs> Description to think of adults as atrophied children. Ah, I love it. Oh, no more discussion after that. Can you repeat that in your mind? Adults as atrophied children. I like it. We've lost the play. Beautiful, Lucky. That was a great full stop. <laughs> okay, so um, let's go do some. Oh, there's something else. One more thing. Yeah. No. Just on Helen's question, sometimes due to injury or, or no. physical organisation, it's difficult to find comfort in the starting position. And if that's the case, please do let us know, because often there's an approximation of the position that can be more comfortable and allow you to get the intention of the lesson. Yeah, like... Um uh, yourself and Anna coming up and putting your foot up on the table while standing yep. on the supporting leg. That was a good solution. We kept you in the lesson. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So please go and um, have a little water in, water out break. Come